Uh, you mentioned that the amphibious marines couldn't couldn't capture Jack Henson. Um, how how did you, Tom McKinney, come come to capture this story? I think I said in the book that uh, uh, General Hallett, uh, not Hallett, but uh, at any rate, the commander of this specialized Marine brigade, he could no more he had no more chance of catching Jack Henson than he did of catching the wind in his fist. Uh, he didn't have a chance. How did I find him and capture the story? I first heard of him way back in 1965 when I stopped to read a historical marker in the land between the lakes and it very briefly told the story of this man. And I thought, man, what a story. I'd really like to pursue that, but I couldn't and I had to go on with life. And uh, It wasn't until 1990 that I began to methodically uh, dig up the story. And I found, the first month I found the rifle, and but I didn't find the family, uh, but ultimately did. And because I had other responsibilities, I couldn't just stop everything and, and, and uh, research the Jack Henson story until about the year 2000. I finally decided that it had gone on long enough, and from that time on, I couldn't do it full time, but I gave it very high priority. And overall, all told, it took me 15 years to to hunt up the story. I was interviewed by the Washington Times, and he asked me the first question he asked me was, "What were your primary sources?" And I said, "There aren't any. They don't exist. Uh, it was like working a." a jigsaw puzzle with the pieces scattered from Missouri to the Atlantic Ocean and a lot of them permanently missing. And that's why it took so long to find enough of the pieces to make a coherent piece of the puzzle, a picture of the puzzle. I spent hundreds if not thousands of hours in archives anywhere that I thought there might be something that I could use. I, uh, I, I'm, I spent probably a total of a month in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I, I exhausted the resources of the Tennessee State Archives, Kentucky State Archives, uh, private collections like the Filson Collection in Louisville, Kentucky, the rare books and papers collections at Duke University and the University of North Carolina. Every county library in the area uh, I descended upon. And, uh, the guy from the Washington Times also asked me what I had learned, and one of, the thing, one of the things I learned was the value of these little rural county libraries and their historical societies. They are not educated people as a rule, and they're certainly not trained researchers or historians. They're just people who care. They care a lot, and they devote hours and hours and hours of their time every week going out in the country, getting chigger bites clear up to their armpits, uh, writing down what's on every tombstone in some abandoned cemetery. And they go down in these dirty basements of the courthouse and go through these old abandoned uh, paper files and organize them and codify them. They, they are heroes to me. And I, I decided that I would go in every one of them in the area where the story takes place. And I put ads in the newspapers, in all those little county newspapers, uh, twice. If you know anything about this man or his story, please contact me. And I, <clears throat> I had some fruitful responses, but not a lot. And uh, mostly, I dug it out in those county libraries. And they'll have these historical societies that, that codify and dig out this lost information and then they publish them in little fold and staple booklets or take it to uh, Kinko's or someplace and have it spiral bound. And then they go on the shelf in the library and nobody outside the county or the historical society knows that they exist. And those libraries are full of treasures. And I went from one to the other, carefully photocopying anything I could find with the word Henson on it. And uh, that was fruitful to say the least, but I still hadn't found the family. And I was in the last library. I'd been there a week. It was my last day. 
it was the end of the day. I was disappointed and discouraged and tired, and I was literally on the way out the door. When the librarian, God bless her forever and ever, a woman named Kay French in Aaron, Tennessee, she said, you know, you really ought to talk to Francis Henson. <laughs> and she must have thought she'd deal with the dumbest guy in the world because I was so tired the name didn't even ring a bell. And I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> she was too gracious to say, you stupid clown, isn't that what you're looking for? She said, well, she's active in the historical society, and she might be able to help you. And so uh, reluctantly, she, uh, she handed me the telephone. I really didn't want to call, but I couldn't say no. And then she told me the number, and I literally, standing in the doorway, I dialed this thing and, and called the number, and a grumpy man answered, and he said, hello. And I told him who I was, and I said, uh, may I speak with Francis Henson, please? He said, no. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely stumped for a response. I'd never had that experience before. <laughs> Didn't know what to say, so I just told him again who I was and what I was trying to do, and I said, I can't find his descendants. I can't find the family anywhere. Do you have any idea how I might find the descendants of this man? And he said, I'm his great-grandson. And I either dropped the telephone or nearly dropped it. It'd make a better story if I say I dropped it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I told him uh, uh, I'd like to come out and see him, but of course he wouldn't let me come that day. And uh, but he, whenever, however many days later, he felt she was rested enough uh, to let me come out. I went out and met her, and met him. He became interested and helpful, but she became my right arm. She, I say in the acknowledgments that the book could not have been written without her, and that's true. She uh, was uh, just one of these zealous, committed, amateur historians that couldn't get enough. And uh, she was wonderful help.